is an independent security researcher. And meanwhile, Morgan is um, a volunteer at EFF and a senior security engineer at Google. Uh, at least that's what I read from your biography, I think. <laughs> and they will talk about the mil militarization of the internet. So yeah, the stage is yours. Good luck. Thanks. Hey, can you do it? Yeah. Hello, hello. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, this talk is to protect and infect, and it's about the militarization of the internet. Um, I'd actually like to take a moment right now to dedicate this talk to my friend Connor, who uh, passed recently. So. This talk comes with a standard disclaimer. Um, opinions represented in this talk are not those of my employer. Uh, most of the work that I did for this was actually done uh, via the Citizen Lab out of the University of Toronto. So without any further ado, what are we going to talk about? So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mass and targeted surveillance, which are topics that I'm sure everyone has heard a lot about recently. Um, mass surveillance, as I'm pretty sure everyone knows, is, is frequently sort of carried out um, using deep packet inspection technology. Uh, there's sort of a variety of companies that sell this. Uh, one that you're probably familiar with is Naris. Uh, this first came to uh, fame or infamy uh, because an uh, AT&T technician by the name of Mark Klein uh, was, in was involved in installing a room using this technology for the NSA at the uh, Folsom Street Exchange in San Francisco of AT&T. Recently, uh, there's been a whole bunch of revelations about the NSA's uh, massive intercept capabilities. Uh, this is an uh, illustration of X-Keyscore, which is a technology uh, used to intercept internet traffic um, and so forth. As you can see, they have a lot of interception points all over the world, as you would expect from the world's best funded spy agency. Um, there's a lot of technologies uh, that are used all over the world, though, to perform this type of intercept. Um, the editorialization of the blood in this slide was actually not added by me. Uh, Amesis is a French company, uh, and they were found to be selling the uh, massive intercept capability that was used in Libya. Um, turns out people were not entirely impressed with this, um, and they were investigated uh, under the auspices of being complicity, complicit in the torture of the regime. Um, another company that I want to emphasize doesn't necessarily sell technology that one would prima facie call spying technology. Um, Blue Coat sells uh, technology which can be used for real-time monitoring of your network. Um, however, they have also attended uh, surveillance conferences and pitch their gear as lawful intercept. Um, you might remember in 2011, telecomics discovered that blue coat devices were being used by the regime in Syria. There was a wall, big wall, uh, wall Street Journal article about this. It was a very big deal, and people got very worked up. Um, shortly after that, I remember reading that people suspected that blue coat was being used in Saudi Arabia. And being a security engineer, I thought, like, well, why are we wondering whether it's used in this country or that country? Surely the solution would be to sit down and map it out everywhere, and then we would just know. Um, so I did that. Um, and so this came out at the beginning of this year. Uh, what this shows is uh, the black is places where I did not find these devices. That does not mean that they're not there. It just means that I didn't find them. Uh, the gray uh, places where the devices were found, but I decided I didn't care. And I decided that I didn't care based on the type of network they were found on. For instance, if they were found on corporate networks, um, the best practice of most corporate networks is to run them in as draconian a manner as possible. Um, and so I was like, well, it kind of is best practice. However, what I decided I did care about was networks where I found them on internet exchanges, ISPs, and provider networks. Um, so as you can see here, uh, we found them sort of liberally used everywhere, um, including Qatar, UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. And one of the reasons why I found this sort of interesting was because the proxy SG device that they sell offers what they would describe as SSL intercept capability. They obviously don't give you a certificate, 
Uh, you have to find one of those yourself, but if you do, then you know, there's a sort of a choose file dialog. You can upload your cert and then start intercepting that sort of traffic, which is obviously worrying. So this was published um, in the New York Times, and what was useful is shortly after this, mainly as a result, I think, of Telecomics's uh, efforts, um, the government agency responsible for investigating this sort of thing decided that uh, it was not cool that Blue Coats gear had been found used in Syria, and they were fined, uh, a reseller that they were using was fined $2.8 million. And that was that. But then something really interesting happened, and it was called the Internet Census. You guys might remember this. Uh, this was a project by which someone used uh, various scanning technologies to create probably the most comprehensive map of the internet that we've ever seen. And it allowed us to see inside networks that previously had been closed to us. So it seemed like a good time to make another map. And we made this one. And as you can see, um, we actually managed to fill in significantly more of the globe. Uh, and what becomes interesting here is that we found uh, this technology in places like Iran and Sudan. Now, Blue Code is an American company uh, based in Sunnyvale and uh, Iran is an ultimately embargoed country, so it is actually illegal for their gear to be found there. Um, the Washington Post published an article about this in July this year, and investigation into this is still ongoing. Now, the ubiquity of mass surveillance is actually not a new concern, right? This should not be news to anybody. People have been worrying about this for a very long time. Uh, for those of you here that remember the 90s well, uh, there was a movement of cypherpunks that people cared a lot about this. They wrote code. And the interesting thing is that if you were a cypherpunk that fell asleep in the 90s and woke up right now, various things might actually lead you to believe that we'd won. Um, the world's largest operating system vendor now includes full disk encryption with their product. A whole bunch of large web mail uh, providers uh, provide encrypted login. Um, the Tor project not only still exists, but has been heralded as being a major force for social change all over the world. And there is now free code that will provide you with encrypted text messaging, um, encrypted voice, and so on. However, surveillance has changed too. Um, <laughs> as it turns out, There was a fantastic article uh, that came out a little while ago in Foreign Policy. In fact, more revelations on this that came out today in Der Spiegel that I haven't had time to really read, um, about the NSA's Tailored Access Operations uh, Division. Um, and what this pointed out was is, uh, much of the code breaking that occurs in the NSA these days is actually not done by their much vaunted football field of mathematicians, uh, but actually by a team of hackers. Um, largely because it is much easier to break into things and steal keys than it is to actually break the crypto. Um, the NSA are not the only people doing this. As you guys are probably well aware, there's been a lot of press about Chinese government hacking, theft of RSA seed tokens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this takes exactly the uh, format of activity that you'd expect. You know, exploitation of a target, insert implant, steal stuff, data, keys, communications, and so forth. Um, in fact, this has actually become recognized to the point where Microsoft, and this is actually very important, Microsoft described US government snooping as an advanced persistent threat. Um, and this is Microsoft general counsel Brad Smith. So yeah, this was a big deal, right? Like, um, when the world's largest uh, operating system provider calls their government an advanced persistent threat, I think things are changing a little. Um, obviously, this has been going on for a while. Um, we, we found out about this sort of thing through the CCC, who uh, released an analysis of a German government Trojan in 2011. Um, and the, the, the thing is that I think we have to recognize while we're going to start talking more in depth about targeted surveillance is, is that it's not just malware, right? Because this has a lot of connotations because we've used all sorts of different words to describe it. Uh, it's better to think of these things as a total surveillance solution, right? Um, this isn't just sort of a rootkit code that someone has you know, proof of concepted. Generally with this, you, you actually get a, a full suite, and we'll talk about that soon. Um, so in around May last year, um, I was contacted by a group called Bahrain Watch. Uh, a woman called Alasha Habi, who is a British-born Bahraini activist and a London-based economics lecturer, had received this email. Now, 
she actually gave me great hope for user education, because uh, she said, um, I got these dodgy emails, and I think it's a targeted Trojan. It's like, <laughs> well, it's pretty well done. Um, and as it turned out, I sort of had a look at the malware, and I expected it to be something kind of boring. Um, so the first thing I did was run it in the dynamic analysis engine, and it just disappeared on me. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Um, and <laughs> looking at it more in depth, there was actually a, a myriad of obfuscation and anti-analysis options, um, which actually just made the malware more and more interesting. And found in the memory of uh, one of the malware processes was actually this code, um, which was Flint Spy V2. Uh, now, I'm going to let Claudio talk a little bit more about why that's important. Yeah, so, you know, that screenshot was actually, you know, pretty helpful for us for different reasons. First of all, because, you know, it pretty easily told us what we were dealing with. Uh, turns out that FinSpy, if some of you didn't ever heard of it, is a part of a larger commercial suite of surveillance software and equipment uh, sold by a company called Gamma International. Um, and, you know, it's a traditional governmental IT intrusion system of, that has different components, including this part, which is a Trojan. Just, just out of curiosity, how many here have ever heard of FinFisher or FinSpy before? Nice. Um, so this is after, you know, Ala came out with a with sample and, you know, Morgan was able to analyze it and we started working together. That was actually the first time where we had a concrete example of an attack of FinSpy um, and, and FinFisher. We knew about the company before, thanks mainly to you know, some protesters in Egypt that found some alleged documents of relationship between the Egyptian government and Gamma International detailing a prospect sale of their software. But nobody actually ever saw that, that specific software before. We never had any samples of the malware, so we didn't exactly knew um, what it was looking like and what kind of capabilities it had. Um, the documents were pretty interesting because I suggest you go online and find them because it lays out exactly how much these kind of technologies cost and what type of specific components they constitute the whole suite. Um, but you know, it's, it's fundamentally a Trojan. Um, it does a lot of different things. Um, this is actually taken from one of the official brochures of the company. Um, so it bypass uh, antivirus systems, uh, does cover communication, full Skype monitoring, intercept calls, chats, file transfers, and everything. Um, records communication through email, chat, um, voice over IP. It can do like environmental uh, surveillance through webcam and microphone. Um, country tracking, you know, all sorts of interesting things, keylogger and so on. So this was helpful. Uh, we kind of knew what we were dealing with um, to a certain extent. The screenshot was also uh, funny because I don't know if you noticed, um, but the string is actually linking to an open source library, uh, which is GPL code. And turns out it's not actually the only one. So they're actually using plenty of open source code in the software, um, which yeah was interesting to observe. So after you know, Ally actually came out um, and realized that she was being targeted, and after we realized also how Pinspy looked like, we knew kind of how to fund it, and it was not an isolated attack. Um, we started seeing more and more things actually coming out. Uh, at the beginning, especially from Bahrain, also from um, towards other targets. Um, you know, this is another example, uh, similar strategy. They try to send some emails to, to their person of interest, and they attach some files uh, to the email, and then they hope that basically they open them. And in most cases, actually, with FinSpy, the typical strategy is that, as you see, they will um, attach an archive. And this archive will contain a bunch of pictures. Some of them are actually legitimate pictures, and some of them are not. And it worked perfectly for them, especially in Arab countries, because you know, Arab Windows systems need to have um, the over, over, left to right override to be able to read from right to left. So they use the same tricks um, to override the file name so they would look like a JPEG, although the Excel prompt is kind of suspicious. Um, and some of the files contained into this archive would actually be unexecutable, which would be the final FinSpy backdoor. Um, but as I said, um, it's not, a, it's not an image. When I open and execute it, it will display an image, but also execute some code in the background. And so these are some of the pictures that were attached to it. Um, the nice thing about this, this strategy is that it helps us a lot to know the context of the attack and who actually might be targeted. Um, and yeah, these were some examples, some uh, alleged arrests of people in Bahrain, uh, people being tortured in Bahrain. 
um, other groups being targeted. Um, this was a 14 February youth group in Bahrain. Um, so it was pretty prolific in, in the last year. But while analyzing um, the command and control server and you know, the structure of the, of the, of the attack, um, it came out uh, pretty incidentally that if you would connect to the command and control server of FinSpy and you would give in just even a malformed HTTP request, you would always get this answer um, saying, hello, Stuffy. It's unclear at this point who is Stuffy, uh, but we were like, oh, you know? So taking this into account, we started thinking, OK, we actually might use this. And what we did was we scanned the whole internet, and we tried to do this, this request and see who would respond in that way. And we published the results, um, which were kind of interesting, and we'll get that in a moment. But despite the fact that no nobody ever acknowledged the fact that this was FinSpy, after we published the report, all of them suddenly started changing their behavior, and the fingerprint was fixed. Reason why we changed also strategy. So um, we actually used several different techniques to map out uh, FinSpy command and control servers around the world. Um, one of the things that we did is we actually replicated the initial handshake that a client performs when contacting the server. Uh, now, we've actually heard there's been, there's been some great advances in fast scanning and whole internet scanning recently. Uh, there was a talk uh, a couple of days ago by the ZMAP guys. It's fantastic. Uh, mass scan. Um, however, since we were actually attempting to replicate this handshake, we weren't actually able to take advantage of this sort of technology. Um, so. We found 36 different, we found command and control servers in 36 different countries uh, around the world. Um, now, there was actually a bunch of problems with doing this type of scanning. As I mentioned, we were actually trying to replicate a handshake. Uh, it was very noisy and very slow. And sort of 18 billion packets later, I believe we were thrown off four service providers. Uh, there, was, there was one of them that even sent me a mail saying, you're in breach of our terms of service. And I'm like, I am definitely not. I read your terms of service, and it doesn't say we can't do this at all. And it's like, ah, oh, mm, yeah, we're still not going to let you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I finally found someone who we managed to explain to them exactly what we were trying to do. And they sort of hummed and hawed, and then accidentally shut us down again once. Uh, but we finally got through things. Um, and so we managed to make this map of, of sort of servers. I would like to emphasize that finding a command and control server in a specific country does not obviously offer prima facie evidence that it is being used in the country that that server is being found in. For instance, uh, all of North America is lit up there, but also half of the world exists on Amazon EC2 instances anyway, so you can sort of draw your own conclusions. Um, in addition to the sort of scanning and mapping, uh, the, the use uh, of this around the world, um, we analyzed the entire suite of mobile backdoors uh, that are provided by um, Finn Fisher. Uh, found Android backdoors, Blackberry backdoors, Windows backdoors, iOS backdoors, and in fact, they even had a Symbian backdoor. Um, and so, <laughs> don't laugh, don't laugh, you know. Um, and so this, this sort of goes back to what I mentioned before, uh, when I said you need to sort of think of this as not simply like a piece of malware, but this is a total surveillance solution, right? Like when you pay your hundreds of thousands of euros, you get people to show up and train you to use it, you get support calls, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This all talks the same format, goes into the same thing. Um, and so the, this mobile spyware provides all of the things that you would actually probably like when you're owning someone's phone. Uh, it allows you to intercept their calls, uh, log who they call and who they receive calls from. Uh, it allows you to intercept their SMS messages, uh, track their location, uh, obviously steal their contacts. Uh, the one that I found the most disturbing was actually something which is referenced in the code as a uh, spy call. Um, and what this was, was when the malware is installed, the uh, implant instantiates an outbound call from your telephone. Uh, the hardware of your telephone is controlled, so you don't actually see any of this. And it has this sort of persistent outbound call, uh, sort of giving uh, a microphone of what you're doing, of what you're saying, sort of proximate to the, to the actual device. Um, and it enables call waiting. So that means if an inbound call comes in, uh, control of your device returns, ring, ring, device shakes, flashing lights, you answer the thing, you talk to your friend, uh, you close down the call, and then the outgoing call reinstantiates, and you have the invisible microphone going again, uh, which I found was actually very creepy. Yeah, so 
we, have, we didn't stop at that point. So we started investigating even more. We started receiving a lot more samples. Um, people started getting interested, and you know, new things started coming out. Uh, one of the latest attacks that we found using FinFuture was actually used um, in Ethiopia, and this was uh, the image and the sample that was used. Um, and again, the image actually helped us quite a lot understanding what was going on. And it turns out that, yeah, we discovered it um, in early 2000, and actually that 13. should be 13, yeah. Um, and it shows map, the, the image uh, shows some pictures of a member of Kimbot 7, which is um, a political opposition group um, of an Ethiopian region, but based in Washington, D.C., uh, which has been recently labeled as a uh, terrorist by the Ethiopian government, uh, which uh, a lot of human rights organizations uh, criticized. Not alone, um, after a consequent report, we found uh, to get, um, during the scanning of the internet, we found some things in Malaysia, and a lot of things actually went wrong in that case, that um, some Malaysian uh, newspaper reported this news um, and said, you know, there's the Malaysian government using spyware against its own citizen, and it reported another article from the New York Times. And apparently the Malaysian government actually got quite mad about it. Um, what happened is that, um, if I remember correctly, um, they shut down the website for like 10 days because of that. And it, when it came back up, um, they, uh, I guess, forced or asked them to add a note uh, uh, appended to the article where they were explaining that these were not true and that allegations were not funded by any sort of evidence and that um, they would also suggest that people would be careful of what they say, otherwise they might be prosecuted. Um, and we're like, well, this was not particularly pleasant. However, um, Shortly after this thing happened, we actually found an attack um, in Malaysia. Um, we found some exploits and some samples. Um, the documents contained um, were written in Malay. Um, the document dropped FinSpy, and it actually listed um, a number of candidates for uh, the Malaysian general elections that were about to go off in May 5th. Um, this was actually kind of a pretty solid proof that they were lying and that actually were using FinFisher. And, and when we discovered it, we were like, well, I feel we might drop it before the elections, um, which was quite fun as well. Right, so um, obviously we've been looking at various samples, we've been mapping the use of this technology for a really long time. Um, and on May 1st of this year, um, we published a report called For Their Eyes Only, uh, the Commercialization of Digital Spying. Um, there were sort of various effects of publishing all of this stuff. Uh, I think. Um, it, it got on the front page of the New York Times, uh, which was actually useful in that a group of people started to care who are actually far crazier than hackers, uh, which are investigative journalists. Um, and they ended up digging into the uh, funding and, and commercial practices of Gamma International, and it was found that they had offshore accounts in Cayman Islands and things like that. Um, in the end, the UK government was uh, decided that they weren't entirely sure about the exporting of this technology, um, and so they decided to stop the sale of this sort of software, um, sort of pending further investigation. Um, yeah, another outcome was that the people at uh, Gamma International were not particularly happy, and this was one of the complaints that they um, explained. Um, So this is Martin Munch, who is one of the key individuals at the company producing FinFisher. And you know, he experienced his uh, frustration on an article at Bloomberg, which is linked below. And you know, we're really, really sorry about this, Martin. We didn't, we didn't intend this to happen. Um, <laughs> another funny thing that you might not have noticed is that he actually has a sticker on his webcam. Uh, <laughs> So it's obviously privacy concern, which is good. <laughs> um, so this was um, been, um, Gamma International and FinFisher, which is one of the company. There are many others. Um, if I can find the cursor. Hello? Oh, yeah. So there is another company, which is an Italian one that produces similar software. And we don't need a better introduction than their own introduction. Do we have audio? Oh, yeah, right. 
Do we have audio? Yeah. You have no challenges today. Sensitive data is transmitted over encrypted channels. Often the information you want is not transmitted at all. Your target may be outside your monitoring domain. Is passive monitoring enough? You need more. You want to look through your target's eyes. You have to hack your target. You have to hit many different platforms. You have to overcome encryption and capture relevant data. Being stealth and untraceable. Deployed all over your country. Exactly what we do. Remote control system Galileo. The hacking suite for governmental interception. Rely on us. So yeah, I don't think they need further introduction. Um, Oh, oh, okay, I'm gone. So, yeah, basically we, we thought, okay, we worked a lot on, um, on film feature recently, and if we must be impartial and also take care of other people too. So, uh, hacking team with their own introduction there, where were they at? Where is this actually being used? Um, so the, the first public sample of um, hacking team uh, that came out was used to target a Moroccan citizen journalist organization known as Mamfakinch. Uh, now, Mamfakinch uh, received um, the Global Voices Award for free expression online. Um, they were outspoken about some of the draconian policies of the Moroccan government during the Arab Spring. Um, and they were also the recipient of a message that wasn't exactly designed to congratulate them on their strong efforts in the area of, of free expression and civil rights. Um, on their web portal, they had a field which said, you know, please contact us about various scoops and that sort of thing. Um, and so they received a message which was in French, uh, which sort of said roughly, uh, look, I don't want to be involved, I could get in a lot of trouble, but you really need to follow this up. And then there was a link to something uh, usefully called a scandal.doc. Um, now, as it transpired, uh, a scandal.doc uh, carried a payload, um, which turned out to be Hacking Team's Trojan. Um, this possesses similar in functionality that we described earlier with um, Finn Fisher. Um, after, after this was discovered and investigated, um, uh, another individual actually came to us. Uh, his name was Ahmed Mansour. Um, he was a member of the UAE Five, which are five individuals that are imprisoned uh, under the charges of insulting the ruling family of um, the UAE. Um, he contacted us after receiving emails from a source that called themselves Arabic WikiLeaks. Um, now, the document that he received uh, contained an exploit, um, and it had a multi-stage drop, the final payload of which uh, was actually Hacking Team's backdoor. Um, the exploit that was used uh, was, if you, if you Google for it, the first hit you get is you get a company called Vupin. Uh, now, Vupin are a French company that sell exploits and claim to only sell them, I believe, to NATO governments. Um, now, they said that this was not their exploit. Um, however, they, they were the first people to publicly claim it as their own. Um, Exploits very similar to this in structure are actually still showing up. Um, one showed up very recently uh, in December. It was O'Day at the time of discovery, uh, used sort of around October, November. It was discovered by various parties. Um, and it was structurally very, very similar to this exploit that was used to compromise Ahmed Mansour um, and drop hacking teams back. Or, um, the compression is slightly different, um, but otherwise there are a lot of stru structural similarities. Um, it seems as though there is some ambiguity over, over who's selling this. 
uh, whether it's Vupin or whether it's Hacking Team. Uh, but fortunately and usefully, a lot of these companies now um, are adopting positive policies. So yeah, this is taken from Hacking Team website. Um, and they're basically are saying, you know, we're concerned about privacy and abuses, and you know, we understand that it actually might be uh, abused in certain ways, and we actually um, cease contracts and stop working with governments and countries that actually do this. Um, they also encourage everybody to mail them in case we, uh, you find any abuse of their software, which you know, led us to think, well, we actually might do that. Um, so what we did was, actually before that, we had this conversation at RSA uh, earlier this year. Uh, I was in a panel discussion with Jacob and Kurt from EFF and one uh, guy from Hacking Team where we tried to engage into this conversation on you know, what's going on, how you guys deal with abuses, what happened in Morocco, what happened in UAE. And nothing was actually very well acknowledged, actually acknowledged at all. Um, however, they, he remarked the fact that they do uh, take care of abuses, cease contract, and you know, react with the customer. Um, so the thing is, you know, we already had two documented attacks, UAE and Morocco, both of them clearly of uh, abusive nature um, and with clear evidence and strong evidence behind it. However, uh, that was apparently not enough to get them convinced. Um, so what we did now, uh, similarly as we did with FinFisher, uh, we started scanning the internet again uh, or even using public data sets uh, that are already available like critical.io, internet census, and scans.io. Um, and there was an interesting thing again. Apparently, you know, surveillance engineers are not very good at uh, disguising their you know, infrastructures. Um, with, with hacking team backdoors, or at least with a uh, dropper backdoor uh, that will later deploy the final one, um, they disguised the command and control server as an Apache server. However, um, they failed at replicating the actual behavior of Apache, so things are actually missing or responding in the wrong way. And that helped, out, helped us a lot. Um, so we realized that we could use this again as a fingerprint and scan the internet and see what would happen. The funnier thing is that by Googling around uh, with the responses that we would get, you know, we realized that we think that the actual software, uh, or at least the basis of the software that they use for creating their command and control infrastructure, it's open source. Um, and it's available on GitHub uh, account of this guy who is an Akin team employee. So we scanned the internet. And unsurprisingly, we found things that were a little bit concerning. Uh, we found a lot, a lot of servers in a lot of different countries. These are the ones that we consider more concerning from human rights records perspective and from you know, a legal and political perspective. We found things in Mexico, Colombia, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Oman, Morocco again, mm -hmm. Sudan, Malaysia, Ethiopia, and Saudi Arabia, and UAE, and a lot, lot more. So, Without even not considering the fact that there is some pre pretty uh, nasty regimes into this list, even just taking Morocco and UAE um, from this, we were like, well, guys, this is kind of bullshit, because after, one year after, you're still actually selling to these countries, as far as we are concerned. That didn't stop. We actually found some more attacks uh, related to the hacking team. Um, one of them we found in Oman um, some months ago. Um, it was interesting, uh, again, in the narrative of the things we see actually don't look very um, criminal or terrorist nature to us. Um, the document that was embedded into the attack was uh, containing a logo, a logo from the University of Ziwa, of Nizwa in, uh, in Oman, and the content was actually an essay on Omanese poetry, which, yeah, could lead to some suspicion. Another attack we actually found about a week ago, um, so this is relatively fresh. We found a new sample. Um, we you know, started looking into it. Uh, it. It had some interesting indicators and things that we recognized. And um, yeah, and then I called Bill, which is another guy that works with us in this reporting, and I said, you know, I found these samples, and it definitely is Akin Team Vectors. I'm not sure exactly what it's targeting, but I have a feeling that it might be this. And after realizing and analyzing a little bit more, we, we thought it would actually might be the case. Um, ESAT is um, the target, is an independent. Um, uh, media that you know is engaged into um, political opposition in Ethiopia, and um, so basically we, you know we got in contact a few hours later with, with the organization, and by the end of the day we identified the attack and the victim and laid out everything to be uh, documented. And what happened was that they first tried to send over Skype an executable with a PDF icon, 
Um, and that led the victim to be a little bit suspicious, and he said, well, this is not an actual article, because the name of the file was article for ESAT. Uh, so that didn't work, so they actually tried to send an exploit, although it didn't work either. However, um, this is just a teaser. There will be a lot more things um, that we're still researching and documenting in a better and structured way. Um, so look out for a report. We'll actually have a report out very soon on hacking teams specifically, with a lot more indicators on the countries and the tax and so on. So we're coming to a conclusion. Uh, this was not the work of just me and Morgan. A lot of people were involved uh, into the research and the, and the reporting and investigations and so on. Um, so, you know, I would like to thank Bill, Jacob, Vernon, John, Citizen Lab, EFF, and Privacy International. If any of you guys are here, I would uh, invite you to stand up and all of, all of us to make a round of applause for all, all of these people. Yeah, we can't emphasize enough that this work did not happen in a vacuum. There was heaps and heaps and heaps of people helping us out, and they're all awesome, so thanks. Yeah, and also thanks to you know, the people and you know, Ala and Ahmed and the people that got the courage to come up and you know, be able to document these, their, their uh, surveillance attacks and be able to use these cases to do some advocacy internationally. That was key, uh, a key thing. Cool. You went really well. I mean, even before timing. Of course. Yes. <laughs> uh, OK, so is, is there any question? Please queue on the microphones. Uh, um. Yeah, there is an enormous queue on microphone four, so we'll start from there. All right. Hello. Yeah. Um, I found it very interesting that you found some free software linked into the FinFish software. And at least in the case of LibGMP, it seems to me like they're in blatant violation of the GNU LGPL if they're actually distributed as part of that program. What do you think about trying to sue them over that? So uh, the author of that library actually asserted his right as an author for them not to use it. And he released a blog post to that effect. Um, I'm not sure whether that was efficacious or not. Um, there has, they, there has actually, Mozilla actually sued um, uh, or issued a cease and desist against uh, Gamma International because uh, they were masquerading. Hey, can you please leave this room quietly? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the first company I believe to issue a cease and desist against Gamma was uh, Mozilla. Uh, there were samples that were masquerading as their Firefox product, and so they sent Gamma a letter saying, we respect privacy, we are not want to be involved in this anymore, please stop. Um, so it could potentially be something that, that could be taken to court. Um, I suggest you find a lawyer that's good at licensing and persuade them to give it a go. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Microphone two. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for your um, presentation. Um, so you may, uh, you may know that the European Union is looking into um, setting up export controls uh, on surveillance, uh, like mass surveillance devices and, and FinFisher-like software. And we also saw on your presentation that basically even though there was an embargo from the US on Iran, some blue code devices were found there. So um, my question is, um, what do you think and would you advise anything regarding um, what the EU is trying to do? Like, what is your advice on potential export controls that the EU could set up to kind of mitigate a little bit this? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so obviously, uh, we are both security engineers and not policy authors, so. Um, I think that there's been a lot of worry about regulation because uh, historically the regulation of security technologies has worked out really poorly for us, as anyone who remembers the debacle over strong crypto uh, will know. Um, I, having said that, um, surveillance technology is, is already regulated to a certain extent, um, as, as you mentioned, just simply ineffectually in a lot of cases. Um, 
I, I think as we generally sort of become more aware of the sort of widespread nature of surveillance, um, governments using these technologies and that sort of thing, that that will sort of get more sane legislation and policy on it. Um, I think that what's, what's sort of important is not necessarily regulating the technology, as I mentioned before, uh, implants, exploits, and that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's the fact that it's sold commercially as like a total surveillance solution, and I think that's, that's sort of what's pertinent to remember uh, when people try to develop legislation around this. As for the specific character of the legislation, I'm like, well, as I said, I'm not a policy author, so. One thing that I might want to add is that a lot of discussion is being done on export controls, and now we should control you know, what kind of countries get access to these things. But not a lot of people and not a lot of movements are actually discussing how these technologies are actually already being used, even in our own countries. Because personally, I still don't understand how the fuck is possible that these things are legally used despite being against any sort of rule of forensics. And nobody ever justified that. And I would like to have some answer to that. Uh, there is a question from the internet. It's on the very left near the camera. Uh, do the researchers provide SNORT or Yara signatures in the reports so that we can check or protect ourselves? I don't see. What, what was the question? He asked if we provided SNORT or Yara signatures. Oh. Um, yeah, we did sure. provide SNORT signatures on some of, of our publications. And in the upcoming reports, there will be a lot more indicators and more things coming up to you know, allow everybody to investigate further for sure. Uh, microphone three? Yeah. Um, well, I have a couple things to add. Um, there was this list of evil things the speaker um, who talked before talked about, and I wanted to say uh, the military base uh, who controls the drones, there's not only one in the States, there's one in Germany too, which she didn't talk about. It was the speaker before. And um, then prisons for profit, which is a topic which would fit to all these other ones too. Um, then I have a question, really short. Um, in Germany, we had this Trojan to, uh, from our government, and there was the possibility to spy on the Trojans and to figure out who they're surveilling or stuff like this, or to attack people because they have unsecure software like this tro Trojan. Yeah, I wanted to ask if that would be possible with the other, with the other ones too. Um, I, I've never really investigated the Bundestrojaner, so I don't know exactly the details of how would that be possible. Uh, the only thing we could come up come up with was trying to map out who was really using it, but it's very hard to get actually into details and finding the specific victims. What generally happened to us is either people come to us because they re read our reports, or we find the. Uh, malware attacks in other ways. Um, most of the times, it's just incidentally, actually. So. Hi. Um, so most of the attacks you um, described today in your talk seem to have been targeted at Windows systems, like all these exe files and the email archive attachments or the Skype PDF stuff. Um, so I wondered, so of course, this is also possible for other operating systems like Linux. And I wondered if you have observed any Linux or Unix-like Attacks. So, um, as we pointed out, we actually uh, did analyze a whole bunch of samples for mobile platforms uh, as well. Um, and I didn't actually mention this, but the uh, first hacking team sample discovered uh, actually contained two backdoors, one Windows, one OS X. Uh, so, you know, there's sort of an equal opportunity thing going on there. Um, I don't think we've... So we have actually published details about OS X samples. Um, I don't think we've published any about Linux. No. Um, I think that probably just speaks to size of user base, though, right? And that um, there's far more Windows users than everything else, then, then probably OS X, and so you sort of see more based on proportion of target. OK, so you said it didn't publish that. Does it mean you didn't observe it? Yeah, we didn't, okay. we didn't find them. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they have them. But as, you know, also considering the kind of targets that we see most of the cases are you know, journalists or political reasons and activists, and most of them, I assume, would use either Windows or OS X in most cases. So it's not, it can't be excluded. Uh, we think it actually, it's absolutely plausible. We just didn't have the chance to find some copies of them. Um, yeah, we have 30 seconds left, so n <laughs> number four. No. Uh, just a question. Uh, the attacks were always infected emails or Skype messages, right? Um, 
There Actually. were other vectors as well. Um, so both Akin Team and Gamma and all the other companies provide a lot of different ways to deliver the Trojan. Uh, the most common ones we've seen, obviously, were spear phishing attacks, so attached to emails and so on. Uh, we think we've seen some with drive-by um, attack. And, you know, but there are other things, uh, other methods that they have. For, in for instance, Gamma have uh, FinFly ISP and FinFly LAN and other uh, delivery methods that I would recommend Googling for. WikiLeaks has published some documents on that. Uh, but yeah, in most cases, it was spear phishing um, attacks. OK, that always answers my question. Uh, okay, right. perfect. So, thank you very much. Just, let's. Okay. So, at 10 o'clock, there will be the next talk, which is.